Welcome to episode number 122 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. We are recording live on Google Hangouts on air on December 6, 2015. We always start out with the worst stories uh, that occurred in communications last week, and BL always has the honors. BL, what was the worst story of the week? Well, you know... Uh, given the news, this is uh, this pales by comparison. But in terms of digital communications, uh, there's a Christmas ad from a German supermarket, and this is from a story by Gabrielle Beltrone in Adweek. And this ad had more than 21 million views in the first few days. It's a chain called Edika, and it shows the story of an old man, and he spends the holidays alone year after year. His children and his grandchildren are too busy to come and see him. So one year he gets, this year, gets the brilliant idea that he'll stage his own death and then they'll all have to come to his funeral. And so you see them all getting the news that, you know, grandpa died and daddy died and everybody's crying and they're making plane reservations and they all fly to Germany and he pops out and surprises them. Just kill me now. I mean, anyway, so... Um, as as uh, Beltrone notes, you know, overall, it's not apparent what the gag has to do with Adika's products, except maybe that people eat at Christmas if they're alive. And, you know, the brand's position is reduced to it's okay to resort to macabre deception if that's what will bring your loved ones to see you and hopefully they'll eat our food. I guess that's what they're saying. But, you know, I was, I was telling you this in the green room before, like one of my all-time favorite ads, well, well, I have two all-time favorite ads. One of them was some sort of cat food ad and, and it was uh, a guy bursts into a Western saloon. He's like, you know, gunslinging cowboy and he bursts in and he says, where's Kitty? And there you see this big fluffy cat and she's sitting on a pillow and she's eating cat food. I don't know what cat food it was. You know, is that a great ad? I remember what they did, but I don't know what brand it was. So in this case, you know, yeah, you remember the ad because it's bizarre and people either think it's funny, which I don't, or they think it's disgusting, which <laughs> I do. And in any case, how does that sell food to people in the rest of the world? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's the old fantasy. Um, what is it from Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn? Attending your own funeral, right? Uh, which is, you know, it's a common common storyline and everything. But again, if it has nothing to do with your brand, with what you do, it has nothing to do whatsoever with what you do, and uh, you're not your brand isn't associated. There isn't a recall, brand recall from watching the uh, watching the commercial. Then why are you doing it? Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, even if I wanted to go to Adika supermarkets, I can't. So I'm sorry, that just didn't work for me. What have you got, Dave? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so uh, I have a um, a product, a, an example of a product demo that you don't want your brand to uh, to to experience. Uh, so this is Master Locks, and uh, this is from a Gizmodo story by Casey Chan. There's a guy named Bonsai Bill who has a uh, lock a lock lab. He's got a YouTube channel called Lock Tube. It's got uh, 162,000 subscribers, and he does videos on about locks. And uh, <laughs> he uh, had a demonstration video for a ma master lock padlock, where you apply a little bit of pressure to one end of an ordinary master lock padlock, and then you tap the other end with a small hammer, like a ball peen hammer or a screwdriver or whatever, or something, tap it with the other side, and it just pops, the, the lock just pops right open. It's just easily defeating the security of the lock. And so this video has 1.2 million views, uh, but it recalls the 2004 incident of kryptonite bike locks. Which, which destroyed the brand. Which destroyed the brand. You can pick, because you could pick them with a big pen, and it was demonstrated through a video how to, how to pick a, a kryptonite lock with a simple big pen. Uh, the brand, the damage to the brand, uh, their, their um, search traffic spiked in, the New York Times did an article about this. The search spike, the search uh, traffic predictably for kryptonite locks spiked as a result of that coverage. And uh, the brand traffic was reduced by roughly a half after the article came out. So people 
uh, half the, the the traffic for their brand was was half of what it was before the article came out, and most of that probably had to do with interest in in the story in uh, how to defeat the kryptonite. Uh, uh, lots of the big pen Wikipedia page which lists the incident is the fifth link in their search results to this day the YouTube video uh, about how to do it is the sixth link in the search results so you know these types of product demonstration <laughs> videos can be killer so well, with yeah. that one that video was by a teenage boy in like Latvia or something he was like you know a kid who had never made another video and he put this on YouTube that was in the really kind of early days of YouTube and what kryptonite did wrong at that time was they didn't respond you know and they didn't respond for a really long time my friend was actually the um, marketing person there and uh, Donna I can't think of Donna's last name and and they didn't respond she they wouldn't let her and it was for a really long time and when they finally did respond you know they I think they said they were improving the lock who knows what they said and and it did come back over time but it did a horrible thing to the brand and to think that this is still happening is kind of sad <laughs> But I mean, in the article that she wrote, she said, you know, basically locks keep honest people out, you know, because anybody could pick a lock, I guess, if they were so intent on doing it. And, you know, those are the kind of locks we use on our gym lockers. <laughs> yeah, or a lot of people use them on their storage lockers. And uh... Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you just hope that you're dealing with honest people in your life. So um, this this didn't happen last week, it happened the week we were on hiatus, but um, all of a sudden on the shuttle that goes from Grand Central to Times Square, which is a one-stop shuttle, the subway was covered with um, unfortunately Nazi symbols. And um, on, I, I mean, the seats on the shuttle car were wrapped with symbols from Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, and they were supposed to take us to the alternate history of Amazon's TV series, The Man in the High Castle, in which the Axis powers won. So, uh, <laughs> you know, they were decked down in the imagery, and uh, it was like that vinyl wrapping. And uh, it started out with 260 subway posters on November 9th, and then the shuttle wraps on November 15th through December 14th. Amazon didn't say anything, but um, a spokesperson for the company, that the agency, Outfront Media, said, well, they didn't get any complaints. Oh, really? Well, they certainly did get them on, on Twitter. And um, they said their standards adhered close to the MTAs, but um, final, and Mayor Bl uh, Bl de Blasio, uh, I wish we still had Mayor Bloomberg, Mayor de Blasio said, oh, that's very bad. But Governor Cuomo stepped in and said, get those goddamn things off the subway and made them take them out. You know, um, once again, New York's mayor did nothing. Yeah, you know what? I, I don't have a problem with this one. I don't at all. I mean, it's, I, 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 as, as I mentioned in previous broadcasts, I, uh, I'm a fan of the series. I watched uh, the the Man in the High Castle. I'm almost done with the first uh, episode, and uh, and you know it would be different if it was promoting something that was you know actually promoting the the ethos of uh, Nazi Germany. But it is this series deals with the alternate history of what what would happen if the uh, if the Axis powers won and invaded the United States and the consequences thereof, and it deals with it realistically in that context, and so. I don't know. I I just don't. Have, it's it makes. I sense. have a problem with Nazi images anywhere, for no. any reason, ever. No. Especially not where you're forced to look at them, as when you're riding on the subway. I mean, sorry, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Do you have another one? I don't. Okay, so um, this is again uh, an ad. <laughs> This is from uh, an article in Ad Freaks, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, in Ad Weeks, and it's by Tim Nudd. And uh, there's an agency called Zulu Apakilo, and you will know them uh, if you saw our show a couple weeks back, because they're the ones who did the hilarious video about people's responses in other industries besides marketing and advertising to being asked to do free work. So now they've done their Christmas video, which is called Jingle Butts. And um, what they did was they brought in this world-renowned Spanish percussionist and YouTube star, Jorge Perez, and he performs this unbelievably cheeky rendition of Jingle Bells. Um, it was funny when 
you know, Chippendales did it, but um, basically what they did was they had um, four people um, wearing uh, nothing, <laughs> Uh, and they they did it, they did it on their butts. The percussion was done on their butts. And um, gee, I didn't think that was funny. And um, you know, they claimed that two of the butts were male because there was a big hue and cry <laughs> about it being sexist. And they said, oh no no, it's uh, equal. Uh, dis you know, no discrimination here. Two of the butts were male. But um, part of the campaign did involve a, a donation to Colon Cancer Canada. But um, no, tasteless, wrong. Uh -uh. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the donation to Colon Cancer Canada. Canada. <laughs> That's a deflection from no from what they know is going to be the fallout of this. Of course, of course, and you know, I mean, again, this is like you don't. It's being spectacular and being right are two different things, and you know, uh, this just without taste. I liked them so much when they did that "Say No to Spec" video, and now I'm like, I don't want, I don't care what they do. But <laughs> after that, so that does bring us to better news, right? It does indeed. Well, why don't you give us one, Dave? So I think maybe, possibly, Adobe will finally be killing a Flash. Yay! So my Did uh, that happen a while ago? We keep thinking it does. We keep thinking <laughs> it does. It's been years in the making that uh, that there have been indications that Flash Flash is going to die. It's not going to die, and immediate violent death that it deserves it apparently <laughs> a lot of time to die but uh adobe officially announced this is from a uh, article on the verge from jacob castronakes i hope that's the correct pronunciation but uh, uh adobe announced that it will now encourage content creators to build with new web standards such as html5 rather than flash doing away with the flash name so they're changing they're taking away the flash name they're renaming the, its animation app, uh, Adobe's renaming its animation app to Animate CC rather than Flash Professional CC. So they are changing the name. It's rather more of an acknowledgment of the reality of the current situation. HTML5 has, has been overtaking Flash as a uh, animation interactivity tool for a while. It's an open standard. Uh, Flash doesn't work on mobile. Uh, it's turned off by default by most browsers. So, But despite all this, Adobe does not appear to be completely killing off Flash. That's that's kind of up to the web developers too whether they continue to use it. But most are real are, are not employing it. Uh, God, anyway. I would hope not. Yeah. But Flash, so Flash is going to be continued to be supported by Adobe, um, but most ho most heavily focused on security. Uh, they'll be working with Microsoft and Google to uh, maintain Flash's compatibility and security inside the br web browsers. They'll be working with Facebook to uh, be, be make sure that Flash games remain secure. Uh, but despite my fervent hopes, Flash uh, does not appear to be completely absolutely dead. It's only most sincerely dead. <laughs> <laughs> it really has to go. It really does have to go. Well, this became controversial this week. You know, Priscilla and Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Facebook founder, were, uh, welcomed their new baby girl, Max, and they launched the Chan, Priscilla Chan, Mark Zuckerberg, the Chan uh, Zuckerberg Initiative, and they basically said, we're going to give away 99% of our Facebook shares to do social good during our lives, to advance um, our, our, our various charitable missions. And that amounts to $45 billion at the present moment. And that still leaves them, don't worry about them, they're not going to be poor, that still leaves them with at least a billion dollars. And so this, oh, sorry about the street noise, this became really controversial because a lot of people said, <laughs> I can't Okay, there they go now. Um, a lot, <laughs> a lot of people said, "Well, you know, they are um, making social policy, and the government should be doing that. They're not paying taxes; they're doing it to avoid taxes. Uh, they should have start. You know, they, I mean, f frankly, I think that they did a wonderful thing, and that it's admirable, and that you know, who else is going to do it? And um, so far, the government has not exactly come up on top in education, healthcare, or the other things that they are concerning themselves with, including universal connectivity. So, you know, I think this is great news. What do you think, Dave? 
I think uh, no good deed goes unpunished. So yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No good deed goes unpunished for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, no transition, but my next uh, good thing that happened is uh, is Microsoft, of all things. We don't usually talk about Microsoft uh, uh, because they've been kind of, I don't know, slow adopter of a lot of things. But uh, this is from a Business Insider article by Matt Weinberger, and uh, it's about Microsoft Power Apps. So Microsoft has noticed there's a need for business apps. Uh, the need for business apps is, is far outstripping the availability of developers to make them by as much as five to one, according to Gartner research. Microsoft is taking names for its wait list for a new service called Power Apps. Power Apps can take data from the cloud services like uh, Microsoft Office 365, Dropbox, Salesforce, plus uh, uh, legacy data. Uh, systems like from Oracle and SAP, um, and makes it easy to create mobile apps. So you just design your app on your PC, and you can use it anywhere on any device. The experience is a lot like putting together a PowerPoint slide, a lot of drag and drop. Uh, you just slide elements into place, and you have yourself an app. Uh, Microsoft offers templates and uh, sample apps to get you started. Uh, it's designed to be simple and uh, not require any technical expertise. Uh, if you have a business problem, just build it in the app, uh, and you can build an app to solve it. Uh, Power Apps handles hosting and running of the apps. Uh, accessing the apps is pretty easy. You launch a, you launch a Power Apps app on your phone uh, find and choose some custom apps uh, from within the app and uh, and then go and use them. And you can invite collaborators to the apps you've made like you would to a Google document. So it looks like uh, 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 with Microsoft's installed base of Office users, um, they're offering a tool to the business uh, community to be able to build up their own apps. So uh, good on them. Will be very interesting to see what people come up with. That 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 sounds pretty cool, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you let people be creative and and uh, remove the technical bar barriers to creativity, and see what you find. See what you get. So Google did something really cool this week, and you know they're not usually political, but this was brilliant. Um, it was called Google Fortune Telling, and it said, what does your future look like? And it, it told you um, that they were experimenting with fortune telling and that you could ask any question you wanted. And so, um, you know, you put in whatever question you wanted, and the answer was, of course, we can't predict your future, but 60 million refugees ask themselves every day if they have a future at all. So we used a fake Google site to get your attention because apparently you are interested in your own future. Please take a moment to think of their future. And then they said, with this project, we want to create awareness and we need structural solutions on a political level for this growing European problem. Please feel free to donate your time, money, and love to spread the word. How cool is that? It's very cool. Very cool. Um, I did it. I put in a question. Yeah. <laughs> Who's not interested in their future? I'd be worried about you if you're not, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, this may be a future. Um, we talk about uh, the short attention spans, the shrinking attention spans of, uh, of consumers to the point that we have, what, seven, seven second Vine videos and Instagram videos are uh, 15 seconds long or whatever, GIFs, uh, visual communications, because people have no attention spans anymore. Well, here's the counter counter um, intuitive idea. Johnny Walker, JetBlue, and other brands are creating short films, longer form, video content. This is from an Adweek article by uh, Christina Mon Monlas. Mon oh my God. Monlas. It's Christina Monlas. Sorry, Christina. You uh, know, people should have their pronunciation yeah. next to their names. I agree. I agree. <laughs> so um, among the brands, uh, Moet, Sh I'm not going to pronounce that because I can't even pronounce Shandon. that. Thank you. <laughs> Jet Blue, Johnny Walker, Canada Goose, and uh, American Girl have all released short films in the last few weeks featuring A-listers either in front or behind the camera. Um, the strategy is simply to offer entertaining content consumers would be more apt to uh, consume and engage with. Uh, this is... The article cites a study by Miss Media that found the average internet users spend 88% more time on a website with video. Um, video is 
the most emotionally engaging format uh, for content. Conventionalism, again, says that short attention spans uh, rule the day, so you should hit and create short bits of content. But you know what? If your content is compelling, entertaining, uh, valuable, people are going to pay attention to it. So, and share um, it. And, sh and what? And share it. And share it, exactly, yep. Um, so JetBlue has a 16-minute short called Hum, hum, human, human kind of, sorry. Okay. I'm having trouble talking today, yeah. They have a 16 minute short called Human Kind. It's starring uh, Sam Richardson, who plays a, sort of a buffoonish uh, White House staffer you. for the Veep, uh, for HBO show, the Z, uh, show Veep. Uh, and he examines humorously how people are so busy. Uh, makes the uh, and the video makes the argument that people should set aside more time for themselves. And one way of doing that, obviously, is to take a vacation. And how do you get to your vacation spot? But you fly there, so there's the time with the friend, of course. But it's a very entertaining video. Uh, it was uploaded to YouTube on October 20, and so far it's got a hundred thousand views. Um, Johnny Walker Blue Label has a video starring Jude Law. Uh, in which he makes a bet that he can race a rare vintage sports car to Monaco in record time, and it has replete, uh, it's replete with uh, Johnny Walker um, bottles everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was up uploaded in November 1st, and it's got 690,000 90, views. And the most interesting one I thought was American Girl. They have a uh, video called Mary Ellen and the Brightest Star. It's a 16-minute short. Uh, it tells the story of a 1950s American girl doll, Mary Ellen, who subverted the 1950s uh, gender norms by declaring her love for space, space even as her male classmates mocked her. Uh, part of American Girl's new dedication to creating digital content. Uh, for this film, American Girl worked with a crowdsourcing studio to help, uh, that helped engage uh, the audience by letting consumers select the key characters. Um, it's, uh, the acting is pretty bad. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not very good, but the audience is kids, so, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be that great. Um, but it's a great idea for telling the backstory of their individual products, right? Their individual dolls, their American uh, Girl dolls, uh, uploaded November 5, and so far it's got 123,000 views. So very That's interesting. pretty significant given the length of these things. Yep, yep. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And, and and I agree completely. If the content is something that is compelling, then you watch it. I mean, there's so little of that. So if this, I hope this is a trend. Uh, the thing that happened uh, uh, on December 1st that was quite extraordinary was the fifth annual Giving Tuesday, the day in which people are asked to donate to charity. And online giving, according to the Chronicle of Philanthropy, was up 52% this year. And, and the cool thing about that, and this is a story by Eden Stiffman, uh, the cool thing about that is that social media played an enormous part. And preliminary numbers from 92nd Street Y, who created the event, show that donors gave $116.7 million on Giving Tuesday in that one day. And the average gift this year was 46% higher than last year. And Global Giving reported a 290% increase in recurring donations started on Giving Tuesday uh, new recurring, I'm sorry, new recurring donations. In other words, people are going to give more than once. Um, that they began on on Giving Tuesday. So um, this is just a really extraordinary effort on the part of all the nonprofits and of the 92nd Street Y. I mean, it was a visionary thing to start this. And um, you know, the leader of it, Henry Timms, is quite the visionary. He's done not only this, but many other wonderful things. So in contrast to that, in sharp contrast to that, <laughs> was the Japanese condom head challenge, <laughs> which proves that there are an awful lot of bored teenagers on the internet. And it, it, it originated in Japan where, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those Japanese game shows where people do the most bizarre things, that, like seriously dangerous things on game shows to win prizes. So this challenge went viral. The story, I found it in the Times of India, and um, basically what you did was you filled up a condom with water, and then um, you held it over the head of your friend, and you dropped it. And sometimes it just covered your friend's head, and other times it, it uh, broke. And that was it. And thousands and thousands of kids all over the world did it. <laughs> Go figure.
has no message whatsoever. <laughs> but it's silly, and it has to do with a condom. So. Well, you know what? Like, we need something silly. My God, we need a laugh right now. Jeez, it's been a horrible week. <laughs> anyway, um, do you have more good news? Hopefully. <laughs> I'm all out of good news. You're out of good news. I, I hate when that happens. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that brings us to shiny new objects, right? And boy, you got some wonderful news here. But um, I just basically, um, you know, Google Plus has been redone. And um, I'm going to reserve my judgment on uh, what I think about that because it's a beta. But one of the things that they did was screw up all your images. So um, we will give you a link to um, the sizes of the new images that you have to have for your Google Plus page and your YouTube channel. You will find that they have been destroyed. And uh, so we'll just tell you how to fix them. Yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, go figure. Anyway, go ahead, Dave. Tell us. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Facebook has got uh, two new features that are rolling out. But Pretty cool new features, and they're joining the live streaming uh, video bandwagon. Uh, they had been testing that out with uh, with celebrities uh, and uh, public figures, but now they're rolling it out to everyone. So everyone should eventually be getting live streaming through their Facebook account. Uh, they're starting with a small percentage of people in the U.S. on iPhones uh, to share a live video. You just tap on the status update. You click. You tap on the uh, live video icon. You can write a short description and choose the audience that you want to share it with. So you can you can discriminate who do you want to share it with. Uh, during the broadcast, of course, you'll see the number of live viewers, uh, names of friends who are tuning in, real-time streams of comments uh, for the video, and your broadcast will be saved on your timeline, so you can, you can delete it later if you want to or keep it for your friends to watch later. Uh, you can subscribe to others' live streams, and you'll be notified next time they go live. And then the other thing they're rolling out is Facebook collages. So this features group photos and videos that were taken together uh, and packages them into a scrolling, moving collage. So like you go out to a concert and you take a bunch of pictures around the experience of having a concert. All those photos would be, would be grouped together for you to package into a collage. So you tap on a photo, you'll see uh, recent moments uh, in your camera roll, and uh, you, they're organized in collages based on when and where you took them. You can edit them. Uh, by adding, removing, or rearranging the photos and videos that you want to include. Uh, when you're done, you can add a title to the collage before you share it, and then obviously share it. They're beginning, they began rolling it out to people uh, using iPhones, and it will be available for Android early next year. Oh, so they're trying to turn into Google+, Plus because <laughs> Google Photos did that last year. Um, I looked at something uh, very cool this week, and I'm going to continue to try it. It's called Social Rank, and it lets you sort your followers on Twitter and Instagram by a variety of different ways, and then you can export the list that you make to Twitter so that you can interact with them. So if you want to test, if you want to uh, aim advertising or marketing campaigns at a specific demographic uh, by, lo by location, by interest, by a whole lot of different ways, um, geo and rank them, and you can then measure the effectiveness of A and B testing and so on. Um, it's expensive for big agencies. It's three to five K a month for, for teams. They sell seats for teams, but it's more affordable for smaller agencies and nonprofits, somewhere in the uh, vicinity of $300 a month for nonprofits. And uh, they have a, in the paid version, there's an Intel um, um, a capability that, that lets you do some really innovative sorting. And uh, you also, in the free version, can sort by a word in the BIOS, as you can do in uh, Follower Wonk. But here it allows you to rank them as well as sort them. So it's, it's an interesting app. And uh, I'm going to test the paid version this week, and, and I'll let you know how that works out. Very cool. Very cool. I'm going to have to try that out. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. I, I, so what do you think is going to happen to Blab now that uh, live streaming has come to Facebook? Well, Blab's the only one that that has the four four seats, basically, right? So you can yeah. pull the chat. So it does have that differentiation there. but uh, And it integrates with YouTube, which is very cool. Yeah, yeah. And Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, next, uh, do you, do you, we're done with the... 
shiny new stuff, right? Okay, so that brings us to projects. And this week I interviewed, um, I'm going to forget his name. Um, <laughs> His his last name is Bischoff, Paul Bischoff, and he wrote a very interesting article on what you give away when you use a Facebook app or quiz. And uh, he gave the example of uh, the most used words that that something like 13 million people used on Facebook. And so, what you give away, uh, depending on your privacy apps, which most people have not set up correctly, is you give away all of your public information and all of the public information of your friends. Um, so, think twice before, because what happens is, your ta I have a video explanation with Paul Bischoff, and um, it, you're taken right away off Facebook to a third party site, which could have servers in a country that has no privacy uh, rules whatsoever, and anything could happen to this information, and um, you just really, really, really need to be careful before you click on anything, anywhere, anytime, but particularly on Facebook, because you're giving away a lot of stuff. Yeah, you, you do. You do have to pay attention. You do have to pay attention to the to the privacy things. But I mean, at least curse or you and see what they're what you're giving away. But, yeah, uh, a lot of exactly. people don't. But Bill, you were quoting in, in an article too this past week. Yeah, I was asked in CMS Wire what it takes to be digital today, and um, so uh, the link will be in the show notes. And it, it actually was an interesting article. Uh, so. It's nice to be quoted. Thank very you. Cool, very cool. I've got a uh, a blog post, a lengthy blog post that I wrote. I it, in 2005 I started my first blog, and I've done I, I have started ten since. Um, and so I wrote I wanted before the end of the year I wanted to share ten lessons from ten years of blogging, and so I did a long post on our agency blog about that. Three of the lessons uh, I I will I share here. Don't panic. So when, you, when you're starting to customize your blog and this stuff, you get into the dirt of it, and sometimes you break it. You add plugins, and it, and it breaks, and all of a sudden, oh, my blog is there's a 500 error. What do I do? Don't worry. Usually somebody's, somebody, nine times out of ten, somebody's already had that problem. Just calm down, take a breath, search Google, and find the answer. Uh, be arrogant. I think uh, one of the one of the uh, um, questions people ask when I suggest people should blog, one of the things they often say to me is, "Why should anybody care what I have to say?" Well, you're going to have an attitude that is, of course, people want to know what I have to say to be a blogger. So you need a bit of an arrogant streak, but you also need some humility as well. So uh, so balance that uh, that arrogance with some humility and and uh, be open to other people's points of view, and you'll you'll be fine. So. You know, my friend Francine Hardaway, who's uh, almost as prolific as you, <laughs> she said when when the internet came along, she went, "Oh, great, an audience." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's exactly the attitude, yeah. Uh, so that so, brings us to um, the daily numbers. Yes, indeed. So these we talked uh, last time or the time before last, can't remember, but recently about Twitter's uh, decision to remove the numbers count from their share button. So share counts uh, went away on, uh, on November 20th. I think, and uh, this is uh, some data from Shareaholic, which uh, took a look at what the fallout from that was. So Shareaholic is a plugin or a service that uh, is a sh social sharing thing with little buttons on, on your on your blog post that allow people to share your posts on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. That's what Shareaholic does. They analyze sharing activity that was generated class. 300,000 plus sites that are powered by Shareholics um, content application platform. These sites collectively reach over 450 million unique visitors each month, so large data set. And they discovered that sharing activity to Twitter has declined by 11.28% since November 20th. So the fact oh. that numbers are not associated with the share counts of uh, Twitter has decreased the actual activity of sharing on Twitter. The social proof is not there, and, uh, and predictably, people aren't sharing as much. Because popularity begets popularity. I'm sorry, I don't understand. How do they know people aren't sharing as much? Because they have the data of how much people shared before and after. I thought you can't tell how much you share now. 
You can't, but they have the data now. They have the data now. They can examine the data from before and after. Once they remove their share accounts, they can examine how much uh, they have the data from because that's what their their platform is is about sharing. Oh, I see. I thought maybe they subscribe to Gnip, which uh, Twitter owns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bad move on Twitter's part. It really is. And I, my prediction for 2016 is that the share count will be back. <laughs> I would think so, but you never know. But I hope so, anyway. Well, and I also think that Google Plus is going to bring uh, back events on the platform, but that's for another day. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, that's the end of episode 122 on the Beyond Social Media Show. And uh, you can find us at beyondsocialmediashow.com, which is our blog. And that is where uh, we post the video, which will be timestamped, and uh, the links to everything that we share, the show notes. You can find us on Twitter. We are uh, BS Media Show, at BS Media Show. Of course, we're on Google+. Plus. We're on Facebook. Uh, you can find Dave. He's at D. Erickson on Twitter. I am at What's Next on Twitter. Dave blogs at uh, eStrategyBlog.com and at Creative PR. Is it Creative PR blog or just Creative PR? CreativePR.com slash blog. Slash blog. Wonderful blog. You must read it. And uh, I blog at What's Next Blog.com. And um, we both have YouTube channels. The Beyond Social Media Show has a YouTube channel. And we have a newsletter. And you need our newsletter. Our newsletter is unlike any you will get. And you're going to love it. You must subscribe to it. And that way you'll never miss a show. And um, we'll be back next week. Same time, same station. <laughs> <laughs> we thank you for watching today. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.